I'm Marius. I've been with the guest team for two years now. What were you doing before you were in the guest team? Oh, uh, I was uh, working on uh, payment and state channels and uh, actually mining software. Uh, my name is Guillaume. Uh, I've been working on the guest team since 2017, uh, initially on a project called Whisper. Uh, didn't work out, so I moved on to uh, more core development and uh, I'm currently working on the topic of st uh, eth stateless Ethereum and vertical trees. <coughs> uh, before that, I was an engineer at uh, various non-crypto related companies and I'm very glad uh, not to work there anymore. I'm Peter. I've been on the guest team for about eight years now. I started working on Whisper and figured out that it won't work out in about two months. <laughs> I, uh, essentially, Ethereum is my first real job, so. Hello, I am Matt. I've been on the guest team for four months. Uh, I've been working in the Ethereum space for about four years. That's also my first real job. I, I worked on the Quilt team previously, doing various R&D efforts on future ideas for Ethereum, and now working on the JSON RPC for the guest team. So this panel was supposed to be an Ask Me Anything, so it would be super nice if you have any questions, starters. Uh, we woke up with the news of Arbitrum accusi make acquisition for Prism. How do you, how your team looks for an acquisition and do you think Prism will be a leader consensus client for Ethereum? I actually just heard it two minutes ago before we went on stage, uh, so I didn't really read anything about it or made up my mind about it. I think consolidation is um, it, it's always this two side of a side of this of a, of a coin, right? We want to be as decentralized. We want to be as um, distributed as possible, and that also means um, that the teams should be independent. Um, on the other hand, if you have a, like a, a bigger company uh, working on different uh, things, um, they can achieve stuff faster, and so. Let's see what the future holds for, for Arbitrum and Prism. Uh, plus, just to add to that, I think uh, the Ethereum vision, long term, the idea is that the clients will be, or the most important clients will be maintained by fairly important companies. Whether the, those companies grow out of the ecosystem or are external companies, that's, I mean, up for debate. But I think, in general, it's good for Ethereum if you have solid, well-funded teams behind them. So. Whether this particular case is good or bad, I mean, that's up for debate, but the idea is okay. All right, I have a question for you guys right here. So thank you for being here. You guys are rock stars. <laughs> so this is a question for the, you know, the ones that have been here many years about the, what is your most memorable experience working for Geth? I remember DEF CON 2, the Shanghai attacks. So I don't know what's your experience about that. <laughs> so I would like to know what's the most memorable experience for all you four? What is the fondest experience working with the Get team? What about the merch? Like, how do you celebrate it? Is that, was that a happy celebration? Was that full of anxiety? We, the, the merch celebration was basically, OK, it's done now. Let's, let's move on. Um, so for me, the, the, I think the most memorable, I have, haven't been in this team for, for that long, uh, the most memorable thing I think was the uh, Greece interop, um, where we worked on the merge together with all of the different client teams, uh, consensus layer client teams, execution layer client teams, uh, in a really nice hotel in Greece. And <laughs> We spent like the whole day sitting in the basement, hunched ov over our computers, uh, working while there was uh, it was like 30 degrees outside. And after the third day, I, I made the decision that after dinner, uh, after lunch, I'm going to take one hour or two hours to go to the beach to enjoy life a bit <laughs> between working uh, uh, in in the basement. And uh, <clears throat> as a I'm in the space around five years, so as a, I'm a Go developer, I 
had the opportunity to read your code and uh, participate something in uh, your Discord. Um, but after the years passing, I, I was feeling that less and less, maybe, or you're so occupied or with less support, I could saw you less and less in Discord. Also, the documentation will become more and more outdated. Um, now, after I saw Peter's, I think last year, one of our tweets that say, oh, we need more support, the other stuff. Did you get some support for the Ethereum Foundation to support your team, and maybe to hire new people to help with the documentation, the stuff? Because you did an amazing work. Go is still being a good platform for, for building this stuff. But I see a lot of people say, OK, I, I'm going to use Rust, other stuff. But you, you have a, we have a very good base of knowledge in Go that you guys built. So how is the future for GAF? So basically, this is my question. Yeah, so that's actually a very good question. And I'm kind of happy that I have a positive answer for that, is that um, well, in the past, we've, uh, most of the documentation that we wrote or stuff we, we published were all written by us. And I mean, that's kind of nice. It's kind of we have to be the origin for those, but uh, we didn't really have the capacity to do it. And uh, for the past couple months, we've actually had somebody on the team who helps write documentation. I kind of feel that we still don't help him enough, <laughs> but we are trying our best. Plus. Um, it was Sina's initiative to actually revamp our entire website, which will come in a few weeks, months, I'm not entirely sure. But there again, we kind of a huge shout out to the EF, uh, essentially Ethereum.org website team, because they are the ones uh, doing their, our new website. And uh, so we know that there's a lot of things to improve, but there, we have received an enormous help from the EF towards improving it. I'm sure there will be a lot of things that still depend on us, but uh, it, things are getting better. Also, regarding uh, support on our Discord and, and everywhere, I think with the increasing complexity of Ethereum and the, the increasing demand of shipping stuff, um, just being there, like our time being spent on supporting individuals in the community is very limited. And um, we need more people from the community to take over, to, to help educate, uh, ed educate others uh, about how to use Geth and this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to answer the question about the future of the Geth team. Uh, so far, people were, were quite uh, positive and upbeat, so I wanted to be the down here, downer here. Uh, I think, I mean, it makes sense that so much of Ethereum has been relying on the guest team before. Uh, there's been an effort, like, the help also comes from other teams, like, for example, uh, the, the client, sorry, the consensus layer clients are taking part of the, the, the trouble, the burden away from us. There will probably be this kind of, uh, of other efforts in the future, and uh, hopefully we can just become a bit more um, redundant in a way. Um, and uh, this, this, this that, excuse me, that would be a true decentralization. Uh, also, talking about support, uh, if you guys have experience with Get and want to uh, help us uh, with the Discord. Uh, we would, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're really uh, looking for, for people who can do it. Although I know if you guys can work with Geth, uh, uh, like you have experience, then you probably get better jobs elsewhere. But, you know, just uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for technical support, yeah. This is Sina, by the way. He's also right. part of the Geth team. <laughs> Yeah, so Sina didn't want to be here, but uh, <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> but Sina gave a good lead into my question, which is to ask everyone who, who's in the Geth team, either on stage or off stage, where do you most need help individually? Like in parts of projects you're working on, whether it's like strategic stuff for the future or like something right here, right now, is there anything you can share with us as community to help us better support what you guys are doing? Like, can that work? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is please be polite on PRs. 
Yeah, so uh, I guess with the guest team, our bottleneck, our single, actually single bottleneck is pull request reviews. Um, we have a lot of very nice members on the team who can really churn out code super fast. Uh, maybe a few people way too fast, like Gary, and we can't keep up with him. And, uh, the, and we also have a lot of external contributions. And there's, the problem is that the code is super sensitive, so it kind of always boils down to a couple of people having to review everything and having to do a lot of context jumps to review them. And uh, unfortunately, this is our Achilles heel because we have absolutely no idea how to solve it. Definitely more people on the team, more reviews help, but uh, it's not an easy to solve situation because we can't just hire somebody to do code reviews since, I mean, the entire network kind of depends on it. So that's, uh, we're really open for suggestions on how to solve that. I think two things also come to mind for me. The first is, helping create better onboarding mechanisms for people to contribute to Geth. Right now it's kind of, you know, look at the code base, find something to fix, look at the issues, find something to fix. Um, I'm taking you don't like your onboarding experience. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think my onboarding experience has been excellent. It has been such a fun time working on the Geth. <laughs> No, but I think seriously, a lot of people have talked to me saying, I have no idea how to start working in core development. And, you know, some people like work through that filter themselves and they find issues and they start contributing and they end up in that position. But I think that we could build some mechanisms for more people to contribute. And I had this idea that I've started working on a little bit is like having some sort of like capture the flag that has like basic flags for people to capture where you do like a core development task, like add a new op code or fix some sort of bug or go through a invalid trace of the EVM, and you're able to resolve it and run a program and verify that you did it correctly. And so that's like a very, you know, binary system of like, I did this right, and so now I can move on to the next thing. And then once you go through that, then it's a little bit easier to come into the whole geth process and figure out like, okay, why did they not like my PR? How do I get this PR uh, to be accepted and everything? So I think that would be a, a cool thing for people to contribute. If, if that's something you want to contribute to, I'm happy to, to talk offline about that. And then the other thing that I think that we could use help with, and I think like all of the execution layer teams could use help with, is um, working on the JSON RPC so that this is an interface that's a little bit more standard across all clients. I think the ideal world is that a client is just simply a black box, and no matter what client you're running, you can always interact with them, ex you know, almost exactly the same through the JSON RPC. And we're trying to get to that point, but we're still not quite there. And it's just generally one of these things that's not as high interest for a lot of people, and so it gets put on the back burner for the most part. And I guess one more thing I would add is that uh, no shade for the other execution clients, but uh, very often I do feel that we, the guest team is driving a lot of the changes, a lot of protocol changes, networking changes. So it's kind of a bit asymmetric in that we are the ones bringing the, for example, the networking EIPs to the table, and everybody else just, well, okay, if it's backed out, and if Geth implemented it, then we'll just roll with it. And I mean, that's perfectly fine, just it kind of means that our, our tax, tax, tasks are always not only to maintain Geth, but also somehow to try to advance the execution layer features. Whereas the other clients are kind of, I feel that they are sometimes just playing catch up. And this is fine for them, which is less fine for us. And I think that that uh, also goes that on, not only goes for features but also for uh, the testing. So a lot of the testing efforts uh, right now are driven by uh, by, by Geth, and um, we're currently trying to build out a new team within the Ethereum Foundation uh, for specifically for testing for cross client testing. Um, so um, yeah, in the in the past it has been. Geth is the majority client, and uh, we have to take care of the network, so we have to make sure that everything is really well tested, and uh, we can create uh, we can create tests for that can also be used by the other clients. But in the future, we would like to um, get to a state where researchers and the testing team create tests for everyone, and so we don't like, and they don't have to rely on on us doing doing the work for testing. Uh, yeah, and something uh, kind of uh, in this area is also um, 
there's, there's Geth. Geth is uh, its own mono monolithic piece of software. Um, but there's a lot of, I feel there's a huge gap still between the Solidity development world and, and Geth. And I, I would really love to see a lot more tooling developing in between, like to bridge this gap. So I don't really have any suggestion about such tooling, but I, I feel there's a, there's a gap here that would be great to, to fill. Um, I have to think of a question because what I really want to do is just use this as an opportunity that I may never have again to say just how sincerely appreciative I am of everything you guys have been doing over the last couple of years. Um, from one developer to another, I know that sometimes that doesn't come through as much as it needs to, and I, it's just uh, what you guys have done has really helped me, um, helped me personally and uh, get me involved in the ecosystem. So uh, if I came up with a question right now, I guess it would be, uh, does Clef have any future? So whether it has a future or not, um, I would say, so Clef was one of those projects which we really think would be very, very useful. However, I kind of feel that we as developers kind of took it to a point where it's uh, secure and it's highly unusable because it's <laughs> very, very console based and, uh, and everything. And the only way to make Clef more usable or friendly at even the least bit, is to actually turn it into a product. And unfortunately, I will admit it that that is way outside our capabilities because there you would probably need a UI team, you would need a completely different team to, to do that work. And whilst I do think it would be super awesome, it's, uh, again, the question is, I, we could hire somebody or multiple people to work on it, we could maybe get an EF to work on it, but there are a lot of other a wallet software out there. And the question is, is it worthwhile to try to compete with them? I'm not sure. So I would say Clef isn't going anywhere, but I don't really see it going into a product quality either. So it's, it probably it will be a bit in this limbo space for now. But something that we are currently thinking about retiring is the, the personal namespace and uh, the, the, the wallet within uh, within Geth, and so if you're depending on that, we're sorry. No, actually, there's a discussion to be had, but uh, we would really like to get rid of this. Yes, so definitely that's the direction we... So Geth is kind of like this huge monolithic monster, and that was kind of born out of the necessity of... When Ethereum launched, there was no other software, so everything, the clients had to do everything, but obviously, having your accounts managed by a node is a bit wonky. That was partially the reason why we built Clef. And we will definitely try to take Clef up until the point where we can remove account management from Geth. And hopefully it should be as easy to manage your accounts via Clef as if you were managing it via Geth. But I think that's the, that's the threshold where we will probably stop. And if somebody picks it up, awesome. If not, then it will be used as kind of as a developer tool in the future. So uh, a long time ago, there used to be a very nice proof of concept running Geth on Android. And I feel that now after the merge, maybe it's uh, more relevant and it can be actually useful that people are running their own clients on, on, on Android. Uh, is there any work being done on that? So originally, we, when we shipped Geth for Android, um, we shipped it as a full node, which obviously doesn't work anymore. Then later, Joel shipped the light client. It's still, I wouldn't call it really production ready, but it kind of worked. However, it turned out that uh, the pre-merge light client is still too heavy for a phone. So now that we are post-merge, that's actually an interesting discussion to be had, whether we could just somehow pick, um, pick this thread up again. I think it definitely would be interesting. However, usually with mobile phones and Android, you have very, very strict limits on how much. I mean, OK, on iOS, you have very strict limits on how much uh, your background process can run. Android is a bit more relaxed, but you're eating, still eating battery very, very fast. So I could imagine some LES client or some light client on demand where you just, whenever you just want to interact with your thing, then very temporarily just pull some data from the network, and, and that's it. Um, then I think the, the post-merge world is kind of compatible with that. So I, I think that would be interesting. However, at least using the Geth code base, I think it will always be a bit heavier than ideal. 
So if you, if you were to really, so the get light client, even if we ship it as production ready, will probably more cater towards running on a laptop. And if you want to run it on a mobile phone in a production ready environment, my guess would be that it would take a different team, maybe a slightly different approach to, to get there. No, so it's, it's like an additional thing that we have to maintain. And uh, we would, whatever Android uses, cross compilation uh, is always broken and there's always something, some issues there. And uh, so it never really works and sometimes it is a bit clunky, uh, the code that's, that gets produced. And uh, so I think another team just building uh, a, a light client from scratch for, for mobile phones, especially after Verkel, uh, would, we will definitely uh, some, uh, see some stuff there. And I hope that at that point we can just get rid of this. Uh, wait. So um, there's also a, a bit of a roadmap issue here. Uh, it seems that, you know, uh, now the direction for Ethereum is to have all of the day-to-day uh, -day operation happening in rollups and having the core layer be something more, I'm not going to say uh, inaccessible, but maybe not the, th the thing you do on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, if that is the case, if, if that trend continues, I don't think it makes sense to, to worry about mobile because no one is going to try to access, uh, access the layer one from a mobile. One more thing I would add is that um, it's an interesting twist post-merge world that before the merge, even a light client had to have a lot of um, connections. I mean, you either connected to a trusted server, which kind of be the purpose, or you had to connect to multiple light servers so that you kind of got the ground truth, kind of followed the correct chain based on proof of work. Now, post-merge, you don't really need that because you have the signatures, so in theory, Post-merge, you could connect to an untrusted Web2 provider and download the necessary data, and you could still verify it. So this kind of opens up a bit of a different design direction for making Ethereum trustlessly work on, uh, on mobile phones. Can you repeat the question? Again? Yes. Uh, this level is good. So what's your take on the Open Ethereum parity saga? And what can the community, what can we do to make sure that alternative good clients don't die again? I think that's, um, I think that's inevitable. So in my opinion, uh, good clients will die. It's, uh, I mean, look at the guest team. Guest team currently has, is about 10 people. Now I would say that out of these 10 people, you have probably four to five people that are kind of more familiar with the very, very internal details. Now, should these four or five people leave, it is very, very hard to find replacements for them. And this is essentially what happened with Parity. Okay, the leaving, it was a bit different, but uh, the idea is that if you actually manage to simultaneously lose enough of your main contributors, then it's very, very hard to onboard enough people fast enough so that the, the project survives. And I think that it's uh, as bad as it is to lose a client, I don't really see what you can do. I mean, the same happens in open source software too, that uh, eventually you have a couple maintainers that just, I mean, life happens, they go do something else, either because they get bored or whatever reason. And um, I'm not sure that, uh, yeah, so I, 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 th I think it is a very real chance and it will definitely happen that good clients will die. There's always a, I mean, one way to protect it is if there's a very, very good funding behind it, maybe a large corporation, but again, if there's a large corporation behind it, they can always decide that it's not worth it to keep going. So it's, uh, I guess the, it boils down to the fact that you need, this is why we would need client diversity because that kind of affords us good clients occasionally disappearing. And, and I think within the guest team, we're trying to prevent this by onboarding new people and making sure that, that uh, the new people that come in get familiar with um, a lot of the different uh, parts of the code. And so, but it's very hard for, 
us being relatively new um, to meaningfully contribute because there are so many just invariants within the code that are not explicitly stated and so sometimes it happens that we break an invariant and it's usually Peter who has all of the invariants in his head and, and says, okay, <laughs> we're breaking an invariant here, don't do this, this is going to, to, to fail uh, at some point. And um, it just takes a long time to actually learn all of these invariants uh, that are implicitly in the code. Plugging back to one idea I was talking about before, just the fact that, for example, we kind of spun off consensus. If another one of those steps happens in the future, like maintaining a client becomes easier and easier. So that would be a good, um, like, um, I forgot the word, but uh, it would be a good way to m make clients not be at risk of dying. But until, uh, until we do, until we simplify the protocol, it's, uh, yeah, it's going to happen. And one thing that I also really like on the roadmap is these, uh, the purge where we try to get, try to eliminate some of the um, old outdated stuff. And uh, so for example, history expiry would allow us to delete all of the rules that we have for executing old transactions. And um, at, at some point, if there's a way to execute them in a different client, and, and, uh, and all of these caveats, but uh, it would make maintaining a client a lot easier. Um, another issue that we always run into is that someone wants a feature and we don't really think about it and care and implement the feature and, and merge it in. And two years later or so sometime, sometime later, uh, we realize that this feature is not really used by anyone, not, and, and uh, we cannot change something because we would break this one feature. And uh, at that point, we have a decision to make. Either we, like, either we just don't do anything or we delete the feature and someone is going to be upset. And um, we don't want to make people upset, but it's inevitable, I think, with the, with the way Geth is right now. Yeah, and I guess just one final thought there. Um, Mario said that uh, if we implement the purge and get rid of a lot of features, then that would really help uh, other clients get up to speed. I think if we, uh, so currently it's very, very hard to write a client and starting a new client is essentially impossible because Ethereum is moving so fast that you, you never catch up. But I guess once we reach the point when, uh, when Ethereum starts to ossify, that would be a nice place when actually new client developers can join in because then you can actually say that, well, I want to make a client just specifically for iOS that has this and this and this properties, and they can work on it for three years without the protocol constantly changing the invariants. And I think my expectation would be that when we reach that point of stability, we will have the original clients be quite marginalized by new clients that are very, very focused to some specific sub task or sub some use case. Thanks again for carrying so much of the Ethereum ecosystem on your shoulders. What is the current yeah. sustainable business model for Geth and probably other clients that want to copy that? Um, and the follow up question is what is the plan to do something similar to what's being down for the core protocol, right? We want a certain percentage of, of it to be staked as a security, um, a percentage of the total value, right? So is there some sort of research going on on how do we get certain percentage of the development effort in the Ethereum ecosystem to be going towards get security? Well, uh, to answer your first question, uh, it absolutely makes no sense to write a client so I think it's, uh, there's no business model behind it. Um, it's currently, most of the clients are funded by, I mean, we are f fully funded by the EF. We have absolutely no income. I'm assuming other clients, usually how they try to fund themselves is that um, many clients get grants from other projects so that they support different blockchains, different layer twos, different scaling solutions. That's one way to somehow try to build a business model around it. But um, 
at the end of the day, since Ethereum is kind of like this public platform, a client, as a client, you cannot really make money out of it. It's, uh, yeah, so that there's no business model behind uh, creating the client itself. The only thing that I would say is that uh, there's the, the proto what, what's the protocol? Protocol Guild, yeah, exactly. Um, that allows projects, for example, DeFi projects, to allocate uh, a percentage of their token distribution uh, to a pot, and out of this pot, uh, client teams get, right now, they get bonuses. Um, uh, and this is, the, the general idea behind it was not to fully fund client teams, but to provide an upside that they wouldn't have if, uh, th that they currently don't have and that they would have if they were to switch to, BS uh, to, to DeFi. Uh, because we've seen a lot of uh, good client developers uh, just say, okay, I can make 10 times the, the money if I, if I create the next token. Yeah. Um, and uh, so the protocol support, uh, protocol guild thingy is uh, like a way to give some 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 of that upside uh, from the DeFi projects. Yeah, appreciate it. Like, I was wondering if you can start experimenting with things like maybe Quadarge funding towards PRs. Right? There's, you said there's a big backlog of PRs and only a couple of people that are capable of reviewing, but you could imagine that with some sort of Quadarge funding, you can't hire or at least bounties for other people to re or layers of developers to review and write tests and integration new tests before it gets to a core developer. So I guess um, this depends on the granularity. Generally, people do do that at the EIP level. So famously, Uniswap is pushing certain EIPs very, very hard, and I'm assuming they are actually funding the people who are doing the necessary research, doing necessary presentation, et cetera, et cetera, to get an EIP through. Now, that I don't think that really works at um, client level because um, we've tried, for example, at some point we, we gave out a couple bounties for some work. The, the place where it kind of backfires is twofold. One of them is that you usually get contributions of not the greatest quality because a lot of people see that, oh, there's a... I don't know, one Ether bounty on this, so let's just jump on it. So you will have 10 different implementations all just kind of trying to hack it as fast as you c they can to get the bounty. So the code is not the best. It requires a lot of effort from our side to somehow try to fix it up or try to, try to guide that person. And the other side is that after the bounty has been paid out, since this was a bounty work, they just disappear and maintenance is our problem. So we kind of have more problems than gains with uh, funding PRs at that level. The, what we have done previously is we have funded uh, research teams, for example, to, who have helped us on the discovery protocol, the discovery V5. We, I think uh, Felix was managing um, a small research team at, I'm not entirely sure which university, and the, the EF was funding them for a year or so to just investigate, find possible solutions to different challenges, write some papers, that one works. So that definitely works. But at the client level, I feel it's, um, it's the wrong granularity. I, I just wanted to say to the original question of like, how, what is the business model for clients? I agree. Like, no, there's no reason to build the client. There's not a lot of money in doing this. It's always going to be like, considered a public good. But I think one way of making it sustainable is, like Maria said, this protocol guild project. And a way that people can like, help make this sustainable for the long term is whenever you're developing new projects to consider adding a small allocation to the protocol guild um, in your initial like token launch. If some of these, are, if, if this would have been something that was around in 2018 or 2019 when a lot of these blue chip DeFi protocols were starting, we would have over $100 million dedicated just to core development. And so I think like going forward, it's like a good thing to consider because you want Ethereum to be around for a long period of time, and the best way to do that is to make sure that the people who are making it happen continue having the funding that they need to do it. Yeah, and uh, adding to this, um, we not only do there, is there no business model for a client, but I don't think there should be, because otherwise you would kind of adapt your 
strategy to increasing their revenue stream, and uh, you lose your independence, basically. My question is related but with what Marius just said. And well, I'm still a student, and I'm still trying to figure out what I want to work on after I graduate. I see the stuff that you guys do, and I think it's amazing. And I still see something more on the application side of things. So my question is really, why did you decide to go to core development and stay in core development instead of going to something uh, higher in the, st in the stack? Because it's way more fun and way more interesting. And um, so for me, the, the big thing is also I want to work on something um, that makes sense to me, where I have the, uh, the, the, the feeling that I'm doing something good for the creator of humanity. And uh, I don't think DeFi is, or a lot of the DeFi stuff is, is, uh, is this. And um, so that's why, that's why I, uh, I was so interested in, in working on the merge and, and uh, helping push, push the merge um, because I felt like I'm, this is like the biggest thing that I'll ever be part of uh, uh, regarding um, like uh, the CO, CO2 consumption and everything. Um, and so just having this big level of like my work can, my small work can have a really big impact. That was something that was uh, pretty magical from the beginning. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's why I am in, in core development. I don't know about you guys. It's, it's, it's not the money. I mean, I would add, uh, so my answer is kind of boring because there was nothing when I started working at Ethereum. So I think Matt's answer would be much more, much more interesting since he did have the choice of Picking one or the other. Picking one or the other is in. I mean, working on, on protocol versus working on uh, DAP layer stuff. Right. I mean, you know, I originally started working on the DAP layer. Like, when I came out of university, I was very interested in how, you know, the types of applications that you could build on Ethereum. And I was very interested in, like, dispute resolution because I had done a lot of, like, e commerce and buying and selling things on the internet growing up. And I was, like, frustrated with the way that these systems. Were built, and so I was very excited about this as an application on on the protocol. And so I, I joined Consensus, and I was working on something pretty similar to this, and just immediately realized that, you know, a the user experience for Ethereum at that time, and like still today, was too bad to really onboard like hundreds of thousands of users to, you know, have this kind of dispute resolution system, and. Even if 100,000 users decided to show up tomorrow, like we didn't have the, the scalability to support that many users on the protocol. And so that was kind of like where I started getting really interested in protocol development. It's like I was like, this is broken. We need to fix it so that we can build an application on it. And I've just like slowly become more and more indoctrinated in the idea. And now I'm kind of at the point where I feel like I would rather be a small piece of a very large puzzle that I feel is going to become extremely important and impactful for humanity, rather than trying to build an application that may or may not have any kind of impact for anyone. Uh, so I guess your reasoning for joining platform development was, you guys suck, I'm gonna I'm fix it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Naively, maybe, so. <laughs> yeah, I don't do that for humanity, sorry, you guys suck. <laughs> No, yes, of course. Uh, I think also it's, uh, it's where the, the biggest problem, I mean, like the impact indeed is going to have uh, like reverberating consequences uh, in the future. So that's, that's where it's the most interesting. But uh, it's also simply because, uh, yeah, you want to have good tools to build better societies, to build better companies, to build be be better software. And I think simply uh, the core. I mean, if you want to work on your tools, you always end up uh, working on the core, no matter. I've, I've uh, worked on, uh, um, on Linux kernel before. Um, it's, it was the same thing. You get dragged into the, you get, get dragged into the protocol as long as you want to, to improve your tools. Hi there. Um, I have a question about uh, databases, the underlying database, and Geth as being viewed as a database. Um, you guys have talked about Geth as being uh, monolithic and wanting to remove or modularize components. And I was wondering, um, since database uh, throughput had been traditionally uh, kind of constricting 
aspect if uh, there were any changes to that coming up. And this question comes from seeing a remote DB option in the command line options and not being able to find any documentation with respect to that. So that's a very nice technical question. Uh, Finally. Uh, <laughs> so one, um, one aspect I'll touch, uh, I'll ask a previous question. A lot of people sometimes ask us on, uh, on social media, why did we pick level DB? And uh, that was also actually also my question when I joined the team. And uh, Jeff's answer was because Bitcoin was using it. So that's, uh, that's essentially how Geth started out using LevelDB. We've uh, actually, we've tried switching databases many times. Generally, what's not so visible from the outside is that uh, uh, databases are kind of built up, have two components. They have a storage layer, which is kind of like this very dumb layer that just has some very primitive ways to store data and retrieve data. And then they build on top various transaction uh, mechanisms, uh, journaling, all kinds of stuff. And most people kind of convolute the two. And most people don't realize that LevelDB is essentially a storage engine. It's not a full-fledged database. And there have been databases built on top of LevelDB which have all the bells and whistles. Now the issue is that the moment you are adding, uh, if, if we were to use something higher level, then essentially we're not only paying the costs of the storage layer, rather we also have to pay the costs associated with running, running the transactions, running, indexing the tables, et cetera, et cetera. So at this point, since Geth was kind of architected from day one to just use a, a storage layer as its database, if we were to plug in any full-fledged database instead of it, everything becomes just insanely slow because Geth was not architected to use these high-level primitives. Geth always assumes that it has more or less direct access to the data. And because of that, it's, uh, we've tried. We have a lot of PRs trying different databases and they always crashed and burned. One thing that we currently are working on, uh, actually Jared is working on it, is to switch out LevelDB to Pebble. Uh, Pebble is kind of like a next generation version of uh, LevelDB, but it's still just a storage engine. As for remote um, databases, the problem is that one of the bottlenecks of Ethereum, of uh, running an Ethereum node, is disk access, IO operations per second. Now, the moment you move the data away from the node, the, actually the bottleneck is getting way, way worse. So it's... Uh, instead of making, making things better, you are making them a lot worse. Since accessing, I mean, usually you have, uh, if you want to access an SSD, a modern SSD can do maybe half a million IO ops per second. That's not the high-end SSD, that's a payable, affordable SSD. You cannot do 100 million round trip times on the network per second. So it, it gets a lot slower if we go down that path. Of course, you could always say that well, we could create an Ethereum node architecture which has a remote database and then you could have multiple clients using that same database. That's a very interesting architectural decision, but that is essentially writing a completely new client from scratch. So it, you cannot really retrospectively retrofit Geth to use it. It would be its own new client. Hey guys, seconding all the previous comments, thank you for the incredible work you're doing in the ecosystem. You guys are the unsung heroes of Ethereum. Um, quick question. If you were to hypothetically re-architect Geth from scratch today, knowing everything we know, factoring in the merge, what would you do differently? Uh, I think we would, at least I would be more careful about the features that, that uh, we accept into the code. Uh, there's some uh, stuff that barely w anyone uses, um, but it's it's still used. Um, and uh, something that bug that kind of bugs me is that we write a lot of like small tools, and instead of having them separate from the client, they end up somehow in Geth. And uh, yeah, I, I would I would have like a stronger policy of uh, not including them. For example, for example, the ABI gen uh, stuff should, in my opinion, be uh, a different thing. Um, but I, I, I already know what Peter's going to say, but then you need someone to actually maintain it. And if it's not in the client, it's not going to be maintained. If it's not in our code base. 
No, I actually agree with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, uh, I just wanted to add um, what Marie said. That previously, it was brought up that the problem is that when Geth was started, we had to be this monolithic thing that does everything, and this kind of makes it leaves its mark on the code base, and it's very very hard to get rid of stuff. And uh, I mean, we could get rid of stuff, but some people somewhere always depend on it. So I think the if we were to start over Geth from way back eight years ago, we would end up in this exact same situation because uh, we would need to make the same tools. And we would end, so I don't think, the fact that we have a lot of legacy junk in the code base, that's not a bug, it's just the way the ecosystem evolved. So I don't think that would have been preventable. If we were to start over now, then all of a sudden you can rely on all the awesome tools that people created and that allows the client to be a lot slimmer. Hey, um, I think it's a lot of stuff changed over the last like one year and a half, but especially what changed significantly, I think it's that a lot of other networks appeared that actually locked a lot of billions of dollars, like somehow that actually are like GAF forks with some changes. And was it somehow like useful for you to take a look on it? Are you somehow monitoring what is happening over there? And if so, were there any cases when you somehow wasn't like inspired by some changes in these clients and you want like to bring them into the GAF, like the original GAF, and like some cases when some bugs were opened in like GAF forks that actually are pretty close to the GAF, original GAF as well? One, one thing I wanted, wanted to say is about bugs. So whenever we find a bug in Geth, then there's usually a lot of different uh, uh, clients that are, um, that are also uh, vulnerable to this. And so we are looking into them and making sure that they are not uh, before we actually, um, uh, before we actually uh, fix, fix the bug and, and, and publish it. Um, the problem there is in which, in which layer ones are we going to look and are we go only going to look at uh, Ethereum aligned uh, layer ones or, or not and so I think the way we handled it up until now is that we um, kind of look in the biggest ones and um, just send them an email that, hey, you should expect an announcement at a certain point, and uh, then we're going to make a public announcement. Uh, because we don't want to be kingmakers, we don't want to say uh, which client, uh, which, which uh, fork gets the bugs first uh, over, over another fork. Um, and uh, yeah, there, there's also been bugs that have been exploited on other networks uh, before they were um, exploited on Ethereum. Uh, and uh, we're kind of like not really monitoring them, the, the other networks, but we're trying to be in, with, in, uh, on good terms with, uh, with the other client, uh, client devs. I guess one, one kind of satellite question here would be that um, way back there were a lot of um, uh, drama around when it turned out that we fixed a bug and we haven't necessarily announced it. Other networks had a problem with it. People very often asked us, why don't we have a standardized way of reporting bugs, reporting vulnerabilities? Have a, usually what big Web2 companies do is that they have their own little private consortia where they share bugs and then when they publish it, everybody in that consortia already updated. And we people were always very, very vocal that we should do the same thing. We kind of felt that that's a bit problematic because in, in the blockchain world, if, you, if we were to create one of these consortia, it's not really clear whether everybody in that group would be friendly or how friendly they would be. So usually what we try to do every time we found a, a hairy vulnerability or bug is that depending on the nature, we always try to announce external people or give enough details to external people, external teams to minimize any potential damage. Now, for example, in the case of Ethereum, what we did is that if we knew that we are going to fix something that's um, 
that only affects miners, or if the miners are good, then the worst that ha happens for average user is that their node crashes. Usually what we did is that we just gently pinged a couple of the bigger mining pools that, hey, we will release a release. You really want to be on this release. Nothing more, just a gentle reminder that it contains something that you want to run. And by having the majority of the hash power updated, the network is kind of safe, and there's not much damage that can be done. But this is kind of a completely arbitrary bug by bug decision on how best to proceed, how, to, how best to minimize any damage to anybody in the, either in the Ethereum network or, or the external blockchains that use Ethereum. So we really try to be as friendly as possible within the limit of keeping the Ethereum network live. Hey, it's me again. Uh, I just want to add that um, apart from the people uh, sitting here and some of us uh, off stage, we also have uh, people watching the stream from the team. I want to give a shout out to Martin, who is uh, from far away, uh, who couldn't make it, unfortunately. And uh, yeah. Uh, who's from far away trying to contribute to the conversation. So uh, some, somebody asked about uh, the remote DB flag. Uh, I, I have an answer to that. Um, so it's basically, um, it does the low level uh, database get over RPC. So basically you can have like, you have a node uh, on a server and you can ha have your like local node uh, connect to that, to the remote one, uh, for some like only read oper operations. So, for example, if you do db metadata command locally, then it would basically get give you the metadata of the remote node. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> uh, do you see snapshots as the uh, as get solution for the state database layout for the first EUB future? Uh, yes. What one question. We are in this beautiful Colombia, South America, Bogota. I just want to know what each of you have like most loved about Bogota so far. Hiking in the rain at the waterfalls. I actually I, I actually really liked working from here. Uh, it, it was uh, it was really fun with uh, like we had some workshops uh, a day with like all of the client uh, devs. And today we had a really nice working uh, session in the morning. <laughs> yes, if you haven't noticed, Marius is the new workaholic on the yeah. team. <laughs> it was uh, it was really nice just getting the, the the people in the room that need to be in the room and work on some of the uh, interesting things that are coming up. And I'm really, really, really excited about the new stuff that is coming for Ethereum. I also enjoyed the hike quite a bit. <laughs> That's the only time I've also left the, the hotel besides coming to here, so... I heard different, Matt. I heard different. <laughs> uh, I also really like the energy at DevCon. It's been a while since we've all been together, and I think it's easy to forget that the community is so large now, and there's so many people excited about this protocol. So I found that very energizing for myself. Uh, Jared, Jared tells me, the food, the food. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, it's... Uh, the, the food has been nice. Uh, <laughs> I like the hotel as well. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I saw the the center the the other day when we went. Uh, we, we went. Uh, looks uh, look, looks quite interesting. Uh, I guess uh, we will explore more this weekend after the work is done. One last question: Who from the team is not on stage today besides Sina? Who from the team is not on the stage? We have Jared <laughs> beside you. So shout out! Huge shout out to. Short in the back, uh, Felix, who's uh, in Berlin, Martin's in Stockholm, and an, a giant, uh, actually a giant shout out to Gary, who wasn't able to make it to any of the Geth meetings for the past three plus years due to him being stuck in China, and the Chinese rules on leaving the country and coming back due to COVID are super, super strict. So. An insane shout out to, to him for still tolerating us and working for us without all the upsides of uh, having the fun like we are having now. Big round of applause, guys. Thank you so much. <laughs>